Open your Bibles this morning. Book of, find 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And put something in Hebrews chapter 13. And I know that I was said I was going to um, begin back in Romans, but something came up this week that has changed my plans for this morning. I received a letter this past week that challenged a popular belief that has been held in Christianity for thousands of years, a couple thousands of years now. Actually, the letter, he didn't challenge it. He actually agreed with it. I'm going to challenge this popular belief this morning. A question that has filtered down through the ages of Christianity from the earliest records of the Christian writings I mean, right after the apostles died, as soon as church history was being recorded, one of the questions that, that has been continually uh, asked and that has created no small stir uh, amongst Christians and has been responsible for more arguments and people who hold to this have held on to this and are adamant about it and they're unmovable and they have a stance that they've taken as though they could be certain about this subject when the reality is that nobody really knows what the answer is and the question that has come to us through Christianity is who wrote the book of Hebrews and over the years the majority consensus among Bible theologians, the most agreement among them is that the writer to the book of the Hebrews is the Apostle Paul. Almost every historically prominent, well-known teacher of the past has held the conviction that Paul is the author of the letter to the Hebrews. And here are just a few of them that have said that Paul is the letter to the Hebrews. Most of these people are dead. You'll recognize some of their names. Some of their names you will not recognize. Uh, Ambrosi, Basil the Great, Gregory of Nyssa, Chrysostom, Justin Martyr, Athen, Athanasius, the Synod of Antioch, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Laodos, La, Laodosia, the Council of Hippo, the Council, the Third Council of Carthage, and the Sixth Council of Carthage, Thomas Aquinas, Clement of Alexandria. He taught that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews and Luke carefully translated it into Greek. He also said that it was the belief of the blessed elder Pentanius in the Western Church, Tertullian, the historian Eusebius, who spoke of the 14 epistles of the Apostle Paul, also Jerome and Augustine, the Belgic Confession, John Owen, Matthew Henry, Matthew Poole, Louis Gosson, Jonathan Edwards, Moses Stewart, the Reformed Baptist theologian, John Gill, A.W. Pink, and a myriad of other believers. And today there are thousands, if not millions of people who believe that Paul is the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Even C.R. Stam and his group believe that Paul wrote the letter to the Hebrews. It's been my experience in Christianity, after being saved for 32 years, that when the vast majority of people, when the herd flocks towards a certain doctrine and they all embrace it unanimously, chances are it's wrong. And Peter will talk about that himself, Second Peter. Said, and many, many, many will go towards those who err. Many will do that. It's a characteristic of, you know, herd mentality. And so a doctrine that is popularly held by the so-called great Bible teachers, the doctors and educated men with degrees from the from the schools of higher learning, when they all hold it together, you can pretty much count on it that it is wrong. I mean, based on that alone, we could go home right now. 
and say Paul did not write the book of Roman. And that has been, that the herd mentality being wrong has been proven over and over and over again. But we won't go home yet. Some have su suggested that some of the writers to the letter to the Hebrews, other than Paul, could have been Luke or Silas. Those were choices, not the favorites. Barnabas has stood out as a good possibility because he was a Levite. We read in Acts 4.36, And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Others held strongly to Apollos because a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. And so they attributed the book of Hebrews to Apollos. Others have suggested John Mark. But all of that is speculation. Even the great uh, Bible uh, commentator, George Williams, the author of the student's commentary of the Holy Scripture, says the author of this letter was the Holy Spirit, but the Hebrew whom he trained was Paul. And then he says this is proved by going to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 25, which says, Grace be with you all, amen, written to the Hebrews from Italy by Timothy. And then George says to refer this verse or compare this verse with 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, the salutation of Paul with mine own hand, who is, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen. The second epistle to the Thessalonians was written from Athens. So not just George, but many teachers say that this phrase, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, amen, is the salutation by Paul's own hand, which is the token in every epistle that Paul wrote. And they say that's how you know Paul wrote the epistle to the Hebrews because the letter to the Hebrews ends with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. But is that what Paul is saying? Is Paul saying that the salutation with his own hand at the end of every epistle is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Is that what Paul is saying? Well, let's take a look. Let's look at Paul, the first letter Paul wrote, which is the book of Romans. Romans 16, 26, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Written to the Romans from Corinthus, from Corinthus and sent by Phoebe, servant of the church of Sancria. Those are the last two verses of the book of Romans. That phrase is not there. However, the phrase is found two verses before. In Romans 16, 24, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel. Then there's three other verses after verse 24. So according to modern scholarship, technically, that would not be Paul's salutation. Okay, but we're not going to split hairs. All right, it doesn't mean the salutation should be at the end according to what they're saying. Not, all right. Now, we're not going to go through all of Paul's epistles. You can do that on your own. I will just say this. Most of his endings are somewhat different. They're not all the same. One thing that all of them have consist consistent is they have the word grace in them. And thank goodness, because we are living in the dispensation of grace. But they're not the same. Some are, some are not. In three of his epistles, Paul doesn't even mention the Lord Jesus Christ. Like in this one here, Colossians 4.18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds, grace be with you. That's not what he says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, that the salutation would be. If the salutation is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, Amen. If that's supposed to be the salutation, 
then that salutation should be consistent all the way through in every epistle and the continuity should be maintained because let's face it, we're talking about the divinely inspired word of the omnipotent God. So, as we look at this today, you know, who wrote the book of Hebrews is not the right question. That's not the right question. The right question to ask is, who did not write the book of Hebrews? Because it can be easier for us to ascertain who did not write it than who wrote it, because God did not tell us who wrote it. And to try to come to the conclusion and arrive at who wrote it is impossible. However, we might be able to ascertain who did not write it a lot easier than who did write it. Because who wrote it, we'll never know if, well, until we get to heaven, if he even wants us to know there. It may not even be important as to who penned it, who the author was, okay? Now, in an effort to demonstrate who did not write the book of Hebrews, it only seemed reasonable to me as I was looking at this that since Paul is the favorite choice of the vast majority of Bible scholars that I would spend time this, moving that, this morning proving that Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. So that's what I want to do this morning. Now, that's not going to help us in knowing who wrote the book of Hebrews. <laughs> but we don't have to know who wrote it. But since everybody says Paul wrote it and they're adamant about it, then... I want to prove this morning that Paul did not write the letter to the Hebrews. Now, the, first, the verse that we looked at this morning that was compared with Hebrews 13.25 is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3.17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Now, you'll notice that this word, this verse, has the word salutation in it. The word salutation is found six times in your King James Bible. The word salute is found 39 times. The word saluted is found nine times. And the word greet is found 16 times. Now, what's interesting about all these words is that they're all the same Greek word in different tenses. Like, this morning I came in and greeted you, but they were greeted when they came in. And also, when you leave here, please greet so-and-so for me, or salute so-and-so for Those are tenses of the same word. And the only variation is the tense, is the end of the, the, the word itself. You know, it's I-U-S or O-U-S or M-O-S or whatever, you know. I'm, we're not, I'm not a Greek scholar, so all I know is the different tenses. I don't even know what the tenses were, but I just know they're just tenses, different. But they're the same Greek word. Now, what I, pro what I want to prove to you this morning, and what I'm going to show you is proof evidence, substantiating circumstances, is that all these words are used in a very specific sense in the King James Bible all across the board. They're always used at the same time when they're used. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, we'll look at the first mention of the word salutation in a King James Bible. Now, I don't have to go and explain to you the law of first mention because I've, I've said it so many times in the past that 
you know what the law of first mention is. The first time the word salutation is found in your King James Bible is Luke chapter 1, verse 29. And when, this is Mary, and the angel appears to her. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. Okay, when she saw the angel that appeared to her. And when she first laid eyes on him, and he addressed her. When he came in and addressed her, she wondered what manner of salutation this was. The second use of the word salutation, Luke 141. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. So when Mary first arrived, she addressed Elizabeth, she saluted her, she greeted her, she gave her a salutation, and when she did that, John the Baptist leaped in Elizabeth's womb. I wonder what he leaped for, joy? Probably. Yeah, exactly. And when she heard the salutation, her cell phone went off. <laughs> okay. And then the next use of the word salutation, Luke 144. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb. Now, did you notice something about all these salutations? They happen when the person first arrives. They happen at the beginning of their meeting, not at the end as someone is saying bye. You see what's happening? Now the word salute is the same word. Salutation in a different tense. The same Greek word. Okay, now here's an example of the word salute. And when you come into a house, salute it. When you come in, not when you're leaving. And after certain days, Acts 25, 13, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea. Why? To salute Festus. Romans 16, 7, salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. Romans 16, 9, salute Urbane. Romans 16, 10, salute Apellus. Salute them which are of Aristobulus' household. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them in the name of the Lord. Romans 16, 12, salute Triophilus. Salute the beloved Persis. Salute Rufus. Salute so, 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 and so. Salute Philogius and salute one another with a holy kiss. Timotheus, my fellow worker, and Lucas, and my kinsman, salute you. Romans 16, 22, I, Tertullius, who wrote this epistle, salute you. The churches of Asia, salute you. Aquila, Priscilla, salute you. All the saints, salute you. Salute every saint. Every single one of these is at the beginning of a meeting, not the end. Every single one of them across the board. Now, so far we've got salutation, which happens at the beginning of your meeting with someone. Same with salute. Salute happens at the beginning. Here's another example. Greet, same Greek word. Greet Priscilla, Aquila. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Greet Mary. Greet Empilius. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them. All the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another. Greet one another with the whole... This is not an isolated case. This is not isolated. This is not something that happens once in your King James Bible. This is something that is 100% consistent across the board and never changes. 
whether it is the word greet, salute, salutation, they refer to a, the beginning of a meeting, not the end, as they're saying bye. That's not a salutation in the Bible. Okay? So a biblical salutation happens at the beginning when you meet someone, you greet someone, you salute someone. So let me ask you this question. What significance does this fact that I'm presenting, this proof that I'm presenting, have to do with Paul not writing the book of Hebrews? The verse that we started with, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle. Let's break that down. Let's break that down. The salutation of Paul, the greeting of Paul, the salute of Paul, the way I say hello to you when I begin to write to you is with my name, Paul. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand. I will write my name with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle. How many epistles will I greet you with my own name that I write with my own hand? How many? Every epistle. I'm going to greet you the same way every time I write to you. And that will be the token in every epistle that I write to you. I'm going to do it with my own hand so that you'll have no doubt as to who is writing the epistle to you. When I greet you or salute you or give you my, sal my salutation, which is at the beginning of the epistle, not the end of an epistle, I will always write Paul with my own hand which will be the token. Now, you know what a token is? Let's look at the me first mention of the word token in the King James Bible. And God said, Genesis 9, 12, this is the token <coughs> of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be a token of a covenant. It's the token of the covenant. It's the token of a promise. It's a sign. It's an evidence. It's a proof of something that I'm doing with you and for you. That's what a token is. Paul's name at the beginning of every epistle is a token it's an evidence. It's a proof that he is the author. And what he's saying is, if my name is not there, I did not write it. Notice 1 Corinthians 16, 21. The salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. Notice the salutation in verse 21. The salutation, the greeting of me, Paul. with my own hand. Now the verses that follow verse 21 are not the salutation. The salutation that he's referring to happens at the beginning just like every other salutation in a King James Bible. And historically, in secular writing, men wrote their name first at the beginning of letters. It was a common thing in the ancient past. But when he wrote his name with his own hand 
at the beginning of every epistle. It was the token, the evidence that he wrote it. It's the sign that he wrote it. Notice Colossians 4.18, the salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. Written from Rome to, Col to Colossians by Tychicus and Onesimus. Okay, so the point now, obviously, is that salutations are at the beginning of letters, not at the end. Who wrote the book of James? James. Right here. Who wrote the book of 1 Peter? Peter. Who wrote the book of 2 Peter? Simon Peter. Who wrote the book of Jude? Jude. Who wrote the book of Hebrews? God. God. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever looked at this, but I looked to see who had kept Paul's name as the very first word in all of his epistles. And I looked at the NIV and the New American Standard and the New King James and, of course, the King James Bible. And would you believe that every single one of them kept the first word in every epistle as Paul? Not even a bunch of Bible-butchering infidels had the heart or the gall to deal with that sacred record. Not one of them. When you get to the book of Hebrews, God is the first word. Surely, they're not going to tamper with God's sacred and holy name, are they? Surely, no one is going to mess with God's name at the book of Hebrews, would they? Unless you believe Paul is the author. All of them kept the name God in the book of Hebrews except, except the satanic, fully perverted, New Age version of the Antichrist called the New International Version. They took God out of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 as the first word bunch of cowards. It was unbelievable to me. New International Version owned by Rupert Murdoch. Well, I'm not going to show you that. Look at it for yourself. I don't, have, I, don't, I, didn't, I don't have time for that. It's not there. Put it that way. It says something like, uh, at sundry times, God wrote to you. You know? It's not... God, who at sundry times, and in, it's, at sundry times, God wrote to you. Something like that, right? Look, the fact is, they took God out of his place. That's what counts. That's what counts. The, the fact is that they had the audacity to do it. That's, that's the, the part. So, so far, we have two reasons why Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. Number one, because the vast majority of Christendom teaches that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and for that reason alone, we could have gone home and, we say, and said, we know they're wrong, because the herd mentality is always wrong. Read Bob Barlow's book, by the way, The Apostasy of the Christian Church, to understand how the herd mentality is always wrong and how the, the church fathers, the founding fathers, butchered almost everything they put their hands to. 
a works-oriented group of people. The second reason is because biblical salutations are found at the beginning of epistles, not at the end. And that's what Paul was saying, that his name, written with his own hand, is the token, the evidence, the proof that he wrote the epistle. And if you don't see Paul as the first word, Paul did not write it, period, period. Okay. Now, for those of you who believe in the sovereignty of the Holy Spirit, in the inspiration of Scripture, this is proof enough. And we could close our book, our Bibles, and go home. But we're not going to do that because there's more. There's more evidence. So let's keep going. When you read Paul's 13 epistles, okay, who was in prison some of the time in his epistles? Paul himself. He was the one that was in prison. He was bound with chains. Did you ever hear in any of Paul's writings that Timothy was in prison? No, you never did. At least not while Paul was alive. Well, remember, Paul died in prison. But there could have been a time right at the end of his life where Timothy ended up in jail. Okay, and then, and then Paul died. Okay, there could be a, a small sliver of time. You know, it, historically, that's not, we don't have any records of that. But there is something while Paul was alive that he wrote to Timothy that seems to give you an inkling of the thought that Timothy might end up in jail. It gives you that idea. And what I'm referring to is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 16. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee, by the putting on of my hands, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Timothy was growing weary in the Christian fight. He, he had lost his original zeal and his passion, and the battle was hot, and he's getting tired of fighting with law keepers who don't want to understand God's grace and he sees people forsaking Paul and every, everything is around him is falling apart. He's like, man, am I alone in this battle? And Paul says, Timothy, you got to get back in the fight. Get back in the fight. And so Paul continues and he says, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but listen, be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You know, Paul may know something that Timothy doesn't know yet. Because is he insinuating that Timothy, Timothy, in light of the serious persecutions against the gospel, that it's possible that you're going to end up being a partaker of the same affliction that I'm in, I'm in right now, I'm in prison? Be thou a partaker of the afflictions. See, if Timothy is going to prison, Paul's about ready, Paul's almost ready to die here, okay? But if, if, if he's going to prison, it's not while Paul is alive, or boy, it's at the very, very last days or hours of Paul's life that he does. But the writer to the Hebrews knows Timothy. And he knows something about Timothy that Hebrews chapter 13 gives us unusual insight into. Notice Hebrews 13, 22. And I beseech you, brethren, suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he comes shortly, I will see you. This writer knows Timothy has been set at liberty. Okay, when Paul wrote to Timothy, 
He was getting ready to die. Remember this, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I'm ready to go, Timothy. He's writing this to Timothy. And then he adds, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. But Paul will never see Timothy again. Because it wasn't long after this that they put Paul's neck down on a chopping block and they cut off his head. But sometime after Paul wrote this to Timothy, Timothy ended up in jail. And the writer to Timothy, the writer to the Hebrews now says, Timothy is set at liberty. And notice verse 23. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. If whom, if he come shortly, I will see you. I'll see you with Timothy, the writer to the Hebrew says. I don't see how Paul could have written this. He couldn't have written, I know Timothy is set at liberty. The timing of it was just not there for that to have happened. But there are bigger problems with Paul writing the book of Hebrews than anything that we've pointed out until now. For example, you remember when Paul, in writing to the Galatians, he says, 14 years after, I took Barnabas, and I went up to Jerusalem and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. And then in Galatians chapter 2, verse 5, he says that we didn't give place to them, to the apostles. We didn't give place by subjection, no, not for an hour. In other words, we didn't bow down to them. They added nothing to us. And in Galatians chapter 1, he says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. No man gave Paul this gospel that he's preaching, except Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verse 11. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, men had nothing to do with, with this gospel, giving it to him or him receiving it. They had nothing to do with it. Nobody confirmed it to him. Nobody did anything like that to Paul. As a matter of fact, we read in Acts 14, 22, that it was Paul who went out confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. And that we must, we must through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. He's the one confirming his gospel. No one is confirming a gospel to Paul. Is that clear? Is that clear? Now, notice in Hebrews chapter 2. Notice in Hebrews chapter 2. And as you read through the book of Hebrews, you will find pronouns that connect the writer of the Hebrews to the people he's writing to. He is identified with them personally. He knows them. He's intimate with them. He has the same relationship with God that they have. Now, this is very important. This is very important. But the word we is found 51 times in the book of Hebrews. The word us is found 31 times in the book of Hebrews. The word our, ours, okay, is found 16 times in the book of Hebrews. So notice Hebrews chapter 2. The writer to the Hebrews says, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? What salvation was it? Which at the first 
began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Now, a couple things here. Notice that this gospel was the gospel that had first been spoken by the Lord. Well, the gospel that Jesus Christ preached was the gospel of the kingdom. That's the gospel that was first spoken by the Lord. Notice that that gospel was confirmed to the writer of the Hebrews and those that heard him, by those that heard him. It was confirmed to him. Listen, Paul wasn't there. When the, those that heard Jesus Christ are the 12 apostles of Christ, which means one of the 12 could not have been a writer to the book of Hebrews because the writer to the Hebrews is saying that that gospel was confirmed to him by those who heard Jesus Christ. So there, it wasn't one of the 12, we know that. Okay? So this was confirmed. Now, Paul was not there. In the first seven chapters of the book of Acts, when those who heard Christ were confirming the gospel that they had received from Christ to these people that this writer of the Hebrews is now writing to, and he's part of that group that is getting this gospel of Jesus Christ confirmed to him. You see that? That's pretty clear, right? Okay. But... Paul never had a gospel confirmed unto him. He's the one who went and confirmed his gospel to other people. See? He received a new revelation from the resurrected Lord called the gospel of the grace of God for the dispensation of grace addressed to the body of Christ. And every letter he wrote had his name as the token written by his hand as evidence that he wrote it, right? Now this writer, the writer to the Hebrews, he has a tribulation mentality. He's conscious of some things that are coming upon the earth that his readers are going through. You notice how he says in verse 3, how shall we escape? Well, you know what? This language would have been very familiar to the little flock. Would have been very familiar to those who heard Jesus Christ speak. Because listen to what they heard before. Watch ye therefore, Luke 21, 36. And pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. How shall we escape? Is language that is familiar to these people and the writer to the book of Hebrews. How could Paul have written this? How could the man who said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, how could the man who knew that you were delivered from the wrath to come write, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? That's not your gospel. That's not your gospel. See, not only that, the Apostle Paul is identified with the Lord Jesus Christ as the resurrected, glorified head of the body of Christ. Paul is in Christ. He's in Christ. That's who Paul is identified with. Let me ask you this. Paul knows Jesus Christ as his Savior, just like you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Is Jesus Christ your high priest? Yes? No, he's not. Is Jesus Christ Paul's high priest? He's not? Are you sure? Because the writer to the Hebrews says, he's my high priest. Notice Hebrews chapter 3. 
Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Paul says, I'm sorry, the writer to the Hebrews says, Jesus Christ is our high priest. Now somebody will say, well, look, it says our heavenly calling. Are we not seated in heavenly places in Christ? Right? Look at Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. I'm going to show you something. What he means by, by this heavenly calling. Notice ver chapter 12, verse 18. For ye are not come unto the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which, wo which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touch the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the great assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, of all, and the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of ill. See, listen, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. From heaven. That's the heavenly call. God is calling these people in the tribulation right from heaven. That's the heavenly call of Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Partakers of the heavenly calling. See that ye refuse not him that speaks from heaven is what this man is telling them. So does the writer to the Hebrews have a relationship with Jesus Christ as his high priest? Yes. Does Paul have a relationship with Jesus Christ as his high priest? Could Paul have written this only if he's lying? Only if he's lying. He could have wrote the book of Hebrews. Let me ask you this. Did Paul talk about the household of faith. Yes. In Galatians chapter 6. And we have, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. This is, a house, this is the house that Paul belongs to, right? Listen. This is the house that you belong to. The household of faith. How did you get into the household of faith? By faith. That's why it's the household of faith. Can you do anything to earn your being in this house or staying in this house? Is there anything you can do or work for to be in this house? No. You're in here by faith. The writer to the book of Hebrews does not belong to the household of faith. He belongs to another house. Notice. Verse 5, and Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken of after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Unto the end. To stay in this house, both the writer and the people he's writing to have to do something. If we hold fast the confidence of the hope firm unto the end. Could Paul have written that to you? Only if he lied. He could have written that to you. Now I could do this all day. 
I could do this all day. Make a statement about Paul that's true of Paul and come here and show you a writer to the Hebrews that's not true of Paul, that only the writer to the Hebrews could have written about himself and about the people that he's talking to. Because the writer to the Hebrews is connected. He's identified with these people that he's writing to, but Paul cannot be connected to them in any way, shape, or form. See, the only people who can say that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews are those who don't rightly divide, those who do not understand that there is a difference between the mystery program and the prophetic program, that God postponed prophecy upon the stoning of Stephen and will resume prophecy, and in the interim is a period of time called the dispensation of grace where prophecy has been postponed. The only people who could really understand that distinction are those people who understand that there is a difference between the body of Christ and that there is a difference between Israel. That's the only piece. See, if you're not rightly dividing and you mishmash the whole Bible into one, remember Waldo, where's Waldo? I'm there, oh, I'm here. Yeah, that's me, I'm there. Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm everywhere in there. Spiritual Waldo. The only people who can really right, do this is people who rightly divide. I mean, I hate to say it, but it's true. I mean, it's true. Because the greatest minds in Christianity, the greatest minds according to man's wisdom, the names I quoted a while ago, unreservedly, oh, Paul is the author of Hebrews, and they do it with such authority that everybody believes them without even thinking about it. So just one more, one, more, one more reason that people say Paul wrote Hebrews. And it's found in 2 Peter chapter 3. And it says, Account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also according to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto us. So, you know, Paul wrote something here to the little flock. A lot of Christians in rightly dividing don't understand why Paul wrote something to the little flock. But the people who read this who don't understand dispensational truth say that because Paul wrote something to the little flock, it had to be the book of Hebrews. And there's only one thing wrong with saying that because this says he wrote something to the little flock, that it was the book of Hebrews. And the problem is this. Notice that the verse, verse 15, says, account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, even as our beloved brother Paul. In other words, Paul wrote something to these people about the long-suffering of the Lord. Well, guess what? There's nothing in the book of Hebrews about the long-suffering of the Lord. The word long-suffering is not even found in the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is not about long-suffering. It's about what they're supposed to do in his absence. In the tribulation period. You read that book with that concept in your mind. How the, what they're supposed to be doing and who Jesus Christ is to them in his absence, you'll understand the book of Hebrews. So where did Paul write to the little flock about the long suffering of God? Well, the first place is in Romans chapter 2. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Now, I'm not going to explain this, and I'm going to tell you why. In our church live video library, there's a section called Romans. Click on that square, and then I got Romans chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. Click on Romans chapter 2 and start watching the videos from the bottom, working your way up. 
to understand what that's talking about. But Paul, in writing this, was addressing the little flock specifically. Because the body of Christ was in its early, early, early embryonic stages. Hardly any distinguishing forms of it yet. And I'm, I, I don't want to get into this now because if I do, oh, I'm going to go into a tangent on this because this is so important that when Paul was first saved, you remember, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I have to say it. I have to. Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. All those people that were represented, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They believed Jesus Christ was their Messiah. They went back to Rome and ba 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 ba. They were from everywhere, and they formed these messianic Jude Jude Jewish churches, law-keeping churches. When Paul was saved, they were in Christ according to believing that Jesus Christ was their Messiah. Paul got saved, and he told them, "Yes, Christ is here." Then. He told them about the death, burial, and resurrection. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. And then he went about to establish them in the gospel of Christ. And some of those people, Luke, Silas, Barnabas, they came out of that little flock. They worked with Paul. They traveled with Paul. Look, there's a verse in Galatians uh, chapter, uh, chapter 4. Um, oh, man. He says that they're of the circumcision. The guys that are with him, they're of the circumcision. Um, where is that verse? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, right there, verse 11. And Jesus, and that's a list of these people. And Je Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. They're of the little flock. They came from the little flock. See? And so... When Paul's writing the book of Hebrew, Romans, it's to a church in Rome that he never established. Those people came from Pentecost from chapter 2. And they're, now he's going to bring them the gospel of Christ to establish them. There was a point after God, Paul got saved that the gospel of the kingdom could never save anyone. There was a new message that was being preached. And it was the gospel of the grace of God. And Paul was going to establish them. Now he's writing to them in Romans chapter 2. And this... This is addressed specifically to them. And this is hard for people to grasp and understand. And unless you understand the transition period and what was happening, some things you'll think, why was Paul speaking to Jewish people? And this is, you know, go and listen to those messages, okay? But there's another place where Paul was writing to them to explain to them why they had been cast aside. And I think everybody today in Christianity knows, at least most people should know, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are parenthetical in the book of Romans, and they have to do with why God cast, cast Israel aside <coughs> temporarily. And in verse 22, Romans 9, 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? The vessels of wrath fitted to destruct. He endured them. He endured them for a long time before he cut them off. You know Romans 11. Romans 11. You know where Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles. God endured them. He put up with them. He was long-suffering towards them until they stoned Stephen. And then he cut them off. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but through their fall, Acts chapter 7, upon the stoning of Stephen, salvation came to the Gentiles. God wrote to the little flock. He, Paul wrote to the little flock, and he explained to them what's going on, why, what's happening in your world. This is what's happening. And he explains the whole thing, Romans 9, 10, and 11. He wrote that to the little flock. And those are big mysteries, how that all happened. But boy, one thing that's becoming clearer and clearer and clearer in my understanding is when Paul was first saved and how he went to the only people in the world 
that believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. They had something in common, Jesus Christ. They knew him as the Messiah. And he went and said, yeah, he is, but there's something else. He died, was buried, and rose again for our justification. And Paul went and established them. Look at Romans chapter 1. I'm just going to, real quick, okay? Because Romans chapter 1. But he says there in verse 11, For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Why? To the end ye may be established. He's writing to this church at Rome, who had, at Pentecost had left Rome, had left Jerusalem, gone to Rome, and were doing their Jewish thing and believing all in. Okay, and he says, look, I long to see you that I can impart unto you a spiritual gift. The spiritual gift is the gospel of the grace of God. Why? That you may be established. Because you're not established yet. I've told you in verses 1 to 4, Jesus Christ died, was buried, he rose again. But you're not established yet. I want to establish you in the gospel of Christ. And he begins to deal with this whole issue. With these, and eventually these people saw the gospel of Christ. They believed. You know, a lot of people think, well, were you in a little flock? You couldn't get saved? It'd be no different back then with somebody from the little flock than today you have, you know, you have, you know a Catholic. Let's say you know a Catholic. And you share the gospel with him. And he gets saved. Well, what did he believe before? Exactly what the little flock believed. Exactly what the little flock believed. Yeah, Jesus Christ, yeah, yeah, the Son of Mary, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yeah. And how do you get to heaven? Well, do the best you can, be sincere. If your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, and you work your way to heaven. And that's the little flock doctrine. I said a few weeks ago that every religion that exists today exists because of the great-great-grandfather of those Judean churches that had left Pentecost and were law-keeping churches, and Paul went to them and said, look, look, there's more, there's more. And today, all the religions of the world, we go to them and say, look, there's more, there's more. You're, you're right, you believe Jesus Christ, that's right, that's good. You believe he died, you believe he was buried, you believe, but here's what it was for. And you, must, you need to be established in the gospel of Christ. You see, and we take them further. That's what Paul was doing. And that's where he wrote. He wrote to them. Not the book of Hebrews, but the book of Romans. See that? Yeah, it's clear, right? Well, it's clear here. I don't know how clear it is there. But the bottom line is this, okay? Ultimately, we'll never know who wrote the book of Romans. Now, I'm not going to venture any guesses. Some of my brethren have done that. I'm not, I'm not going to venture any guesses. But I know in my heart who did not write it. Paul did not write the book of Hebrews. And just knowing that for myself, that's fine. Nobody in this world could convince me that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. It doesn't even make sense to come to that conclusion. Would you agree? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time that we can spend in the word of God. I thank you that we can compare spiritual with spiritual and look at things that are not, they're not ifs or maybes. But we can look at things that are factual truth, evidence, proof, and compare them and say, they're not the same. And therefore, to be true to the scripture, we will just believe what the King James Bible says and let it rest, let it stand on its own merit. So I pray that whatever conclusion someone comes to, that their conclusion will be based upon the word of God. I thank you for this time in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ.